artists, I mean, and, and performers, but, you know, on venues, um, on, um, you know, just all the service providers that are linked to the live industry. And it's, uh, it's going to take a long time for, um, you know, for the industry to make up for that type of, of, of loss. Um, that was the main earning stream of, I'd say, 90% of our performers in South Africa. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Just to pause and welcome um, one more panelist. Um, we have Funani Lavisha, the CEO of Sampra South Africa, um, joining us as well on the panel. Thanks for, for coming through. Okay. Thank you. We've just kicked off. so. Um, the question we're actually running with right now is, amongst the major shifts that have impacted the local music industry, um, we obviously can't ignore COVID. We know that we're, we're in store potentially for some more announcements that are going to cut off live and gathering. Um, and so that's the shift um, Roland was just unpacking. And you well, maybe we can have your thoughts and then uh, move to you. Can you remind me the question? <laughs> We're talking about the, the shift and what COVID has actually done as an impact in the South African, globally, obviously, but you know, in South Africa, we've been particularly affected by lockdowns. I mean, obviously, the live business has been the most affected. And for an artist, um, that's the line show of the revenue. Right. Um, besides that, sponsorship has been a bit challenging as well. So that's another revenue stream that has been uh, challenged. and. On the digital front, we've never been better um, worldwide. The, the, the business has grown. South Africa, the business has grown um, in Africa as well. So that's good, but that's a smaller portion for, for South African artists. Right. Um, <clears throat> on top of it, if you want to compare to other countries around the world, and especially in a few the major countries in Europe, the support of government um, to the arts and to the artists in many countries in Europe has been incredible compared to i mean i'm not blaming the government but there's a huge difference you know they, they kept being supported <clears throat> because they knew i mean uh, music and art is as, as we always say is um gives the identity of a country and you cannot not support that because without that you don't have you know that's that's really what the identity is. It's one of the main elements of the identity. And in many countries, government have realized that. So COVID or not COVID, you need to make sure that the creative work happens during those times. And you don't just have a gap of two years or three years or whatever, how many years we're going to be with this COVID. But, um, and, and that's one of the, the differences. But yeah, the live is the main one. Yeah, I suppose um, live was directly afflicted and then it had a knock-on effect on so many other things. Sponsorship, as you said, was just uh, another one of it, overall marketing revenue. Um, do you have some thoughts on this as well? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the lockdown has forced the industry to be more innovative and to embrace um, fourth industrial uh, technology, fourth industrial revolution technology. Before the lockdown, everybody was talking about fourth industrial revolution technology, but without paying much attention what the implications were and what that technology, technology was actually all about. I recall in September 2019, um, at a conference I was talking about the future. And I was saying that one of the things that will happen in the next five years would be virtual concerts. Uh, nobody at that conference knew what I was talking about. And six months later, people were now calling me and saying, you spoke about a virtual concert six months ago, how can we do those virtual concerts? Because they, fo they found themselves in, in a lockdown. So yes, the lockdown has been very bad for, um, for the industry, but at the same time, it has forced us to, to wake up and, and smell the coffee. Um, on the issue of sponsorship, yes, um, live performances were devastated. Up to now, they haven't recovered the way they were before, before the lockdown. Fortunately, on our side, although I may say maybe it was more coincidental, is that we launched what we call the Sampra Development Fund in August last year. And one of the things, this was conceived before 
the lockdown to say we need to have this fund to help the industry, to fund artists and um, to do a, a whole lot of things. But the lockdown also forced us to rethink the, whole, the entire model and to say what can we do as SAMPRA to help this industry that has been devastated by, 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 by the lockdown. And I'm happy to say that since we launched that fund, it's working very well, and we do a number of things. Um, music, we, we fund music production, mm -hmm. and by funding music production, we, we are not competing with record companies, and we are not even claiming the ownership of the sound recording. We are helping our members so that they can produce more music. So we, we do um, music production. We are also funding live performances. It's, it's one of those things that we, need, we had to do because we said, we need to play a role in ensuring that the industry recovers. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the situation may be looking very gloomy right now, but I think the future is, more, is much more brighter than it is, uh, it is before the lockdown. Yeah. That's a great positive outlook to, to actually have. Um, I'm just wondering if there are other similar initiatives um, that have also come about as a result to support uh, creators, content creators, production, and so forth. Yoel, I mean, we, you aware? We, we're both sitting on the board of Capasso, and Capasso has been doing that as well. Um, they're supporting songwriters and composers in their own way at, at those critical times. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's important. I mean, we as a company, we, we're all trying, I think. I mean, we were trying to give more advances that we used to give before just because we realized it was more difficult. Also, one thing, I mean, of course, there's a transformation, as you said, but one of the things that made the, the, the COVID, I mean, I don't think we went into the COVID discussion, but if you want to talk about COVID, one of the things that happens is that suddenly people were staying at home, so they had to start to focus on the digital side, the artists and the record labels, and, you know, so they started to look at how can I make more money, how do I read better the data that I'm getting from the, from the, the record label, the distributors. Um, so it forced them to look at it, and in a way, it helped us to be more at the center of, you know, focus for, for the, uh, the artists and the labels. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, we've got so many, if you look at the Amapiano world or whatever, DJs, we've got so many that we work with, they have what, between six and 16 concerts every weekend. I mean, weekend from Thursday night to Monday night. Uh, I mean, you can't replace that, you know, that's, we're not even, it's not even the tip of the iceberg. Yes, I'd maybe just to add to, to the point of Ama Piano, it's the most dominant music genre in, in Africa today. Um, and it, it comes from South Africa. And that's why I was saying that, for me, the future looks much more brighter than what we are looking at right now. If you look at the current, yes, you won't see much. But if you cast your eyes ahead, you can see that we will get out of this pandemic much more stronger than we were. And, and another thing that I forgot to mention is, is the fact that when we went into the lockdown, because we knew that live performances had been canceled, and we knew that a lot of recording artists make money from live performances, we decided to bring forward two major distributions. And not only that, we went out of our way to look for artists whose money we had, but some of them didn't even know that we had their money. Between April 2020 and the 31st of December 2020, we had distributed almost 300 million rents to, to artists. And we did that as a way of, of trying to alleviate the effects of COVID-19 on them. And we were not the only one um, internationally. Our international counterparts were doing the same thing to the point that last year was the only year where we got more money from Europeans than we ever received. Why? Because everybody was looking for money everywhere. And we took advantage of that and said, we, we, we will pay you, but you must also pay us. And for the first time, they paid us more money than we had ever received. So yes, it's, it's currently not so good, but we will get there and we'll get up strong. So what is the period you distributed 300 million? Uh, the 1st of April to the 31st of December last year. In nine months? Yeah. Okay. We, we were running distributions twice a week uh, because of the volumes that we were receiving wow. of people uh, claiming. And those are people that we were following up. And remember, we, we, we've been working from home, but <coughs> even right now, you can't tell. When you call us, you won't even tell that um, people are working from home. That's how we have also embraced this technology to make it possible for everyone. So our members were calling us saying, 
do you happen to have my money? We'll say, yes, we do, but you, you need to register. So we, we found ourselves running distributions twice a week, which was phenomenal. That is phenomenal to hear. So an increase in distributions, the creation of a fund to support production, live and well, virtually live events. Um, Capasso also played a role. Um, I don't know if you want to describe a little bit more of those activities, Yoel. And then I'd like to hear on the publishing side as well. I'll free you all up for, uh, for a minute. No, no, I was just, sorry, I was just going to say, I don't know if we need to introduce what each of us do, because we introduced about the title, but I don't know if everybody knows. That's true. Um, actually, perspective. Oh, okay. if we can maybe just, especially um, when you jumped in, if you don't mind describing the work of Sampra to anybody that um, isn't familiar. Yeah, okay, thank you. My <coughs> name is uh, Fanani Leshiva. I'm the CEO of Sampra. Sampra is a neighboring right um, CMO, neighboring right in South Africa is commonly referred to as needle time. Um, I prefer the term, the term neighboring right that is because that is the correct term. And what we do is that we administer neighboring right on behalf of record companies and recording artists. So unlike Samro and Capasso who administer um, um, rights on behalf of authors, composers and publishers, we deal, deal with the people that recorded the music. Um, the record company as well as the recording artists. And when we process distributions, we split the royalty 50-50 between the record company that owns the track as well as the performers that performed when that track was recorded. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Yeah, well, what about I'm going to say in, in three <laughs> words, we're a digital distribution uh, company like an aggregator. We offer label services. We only focus on African music. We're selling to older stores. So we all the stores around the world from Spotify, YouTube, Apple, Amazon, and um, yeah, we work with record labels and uh, artists. Yeah, I'm Roland Naka <coughs> and Managing Director for Sony Music uh, Publishing. Um, yeah, we work with uh, composers and authors, other independent publishers um, that we represent. Um, and it's, yeah, it's about protecting their rights and making sure that they have um, commercial value out there in the marketplace, um, you know, cre and creating op creative opportunities for them out there so that they can earn revenue. Good. I think that's the context, maybe, if you needed that for the conversation that's already begun. Um, but you wanted to pick up on yeah. some of those initiatives, please. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, as Sony Music Publishing, we've definitely had a songwriter's first initiative. Um, and I mean, one of the things is, you know, Yoel touched on talking about advances, but there are many people, many writers and composers who had ad advances from years ago, you know, from prior to 2000. And one of the things the company did was actually write off any advances that were sitting on the books pre-2000. And that really did give an opportunity for those writers um, to be able to have an opportunity again to earn from their compositions um, as of still being in the red. Um, another initiative was around um, just fast tracking processing. So we did what we called real time processing. Um, so if we received a digital pr uh, distribution, um, example, Jan, March, we got it in say June, we were able to process it much, uh, much more earlier and process it by September. So real time processing. Um, and I think that was able to fast track, um, you know, uh, a composer's earnings into their pocket and just help tie them over to the next time. Notwithstanding that, I mean, those that we're not able to earn in this time, yeah, advances was the one where we were able to assist them with, yeah. Okay, good. So um, increased distribution, writing off advances, um, in, you know, ha well, signing new advances for artists that need it in order to get to from, from one to the next, I guess. Um, there are other interesting shifts that actually you've, you've alluded to it as well in terms of, of tech, of virtual, of pushing us forward into that direction. Um, what do you think we still need to do in order to create an enabling environment um, for that? Or what do you see happening next? I think we need to teach the public that a, a concert does not have to be physical. Um, you may stage a virtual concert, but how many people have bought into the idea of a, of a virtual concert? And I think we can try to do a hybrid, a, a hybrid model where um, even before COVID, I, I was never a fan of stadiums. 
Uh, I would go to the stadium being dragged and uh, kicking and, and really? screaming. Yeah, I was never a fan of, of stadium. So, um, and this is what I was saying at that conference that I was talking about earlier, that I would love to watch certain concerts live, but virtually, because I don't like going to the stadium. And so that's why I'm saying we need to start thinking of a hybrid model where you say those that don't mind um, going to the stadium, let them go to the stadium. But those of us who still want to enjoy the same content, allow us the opportunity to watch it virtually. And the technology is there. All I need to do is to buy the ticket with all the login details and sit at home <coughs> and watch that concert. In fact, maybe I'll get a better view uh, than somebody <laughs> who is at the stadium but three meters or not even 100 meters away from the stage. If I'm watching from home, I don't have to worry about um, whether my car would be broken to into um, wh while, I, while I'm busy enjoying the concert. And I even gave an example that I don't even have to worry about smelly toilets because I'm, I'm home. So <laughs> as the industry, we, we, we need to start pushing this idea of a hybrid, hybrid model. Um, we need to also acknowledge the fact that some people sometimes don't know what they want. But if you, you, you know that this is good for them, you need to push it. You need to market it vigorously. So as, as the industry, I think we can do it. Um, and this is one of the things that we are already experimenting with um, through the, our fund to say that um, the, the, the concerts that we funded last <coughs> year, they were all virtual. But the attendance was not that, that good, although the artists would have made money, which was fine with us. But um, unfortunately, the National Command Council is meeting again on Sunday. Maybe they are going to tomorrow. Maybe they are going. Yeah, they are meeting today. Uh, yeah, maybe they are going to take us back to level five. I don't know. But um, coronavirus or no coronavirus, we we need to to go to that point of saying a consent is no longer just a physical consent. It's it's a combination of physical and and and, and virtual. And you can make more money. Imagine. Um, that Beyonce, Beyonce concert in, at, at, at FNB Stadium, I think it was in 2019, where it was sold out, a lot of people still wanted to buy tickets, but they could not. Had that concert been a hybrid concert, the organizers would have made far much more money than, 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 than they made. So we need to open our eyes and say, this is where the world is going. And w w as the industry, we need to market that and push that, educate the public, make it clear as to, to people that you don't have to be at the stadium or uh, the dome, where, where, wherever it is. But I, I think with young guys, the younger generation is easy to convince them about that than the older people because um, some of them are technophobes and, and all that. Okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's great to hear that from you. I think for me, I've enjoyed the, the reprieve that we've had without a lockdown, uh, to be on the road again, to see some live. Um, the artists definitely took a lot from that, you know, to be able to be out there and connect with fans. But I, I agree with you, there are definitely ways of replicating some of that um, fun um, in a digital experience. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure if when COVID happened, like you said, if we were ready, um, not from the artists, the fans, the audience, the platforms, the data, um, and, and so many other challenges. Um, but Yoel, I mean, you've already spoken about digital sales, recording sales revenue skyrocketing. Are the two linked in any way? A link with what? With Live shows, digital shows, digital <coughs> sales, streaming. I don't know. I like I like the live. Um, I'm not a technophobe, <laughs> um, and I don't presume what people want. You know, um, that's what nice thing with technology is. We tend to, to check to see what people like. We've got enough data, and we follow up on that. If you want to go there, we can go to metaverse as well. We can go to all kind of new areas of music. But I think. If we go back to the subject of today, which is really South African business, um, I think that's the most interesting thing is how do we, it's great to know, I mean, look, I've, I've always looked at what's gonna be in 10 years or in 20 years and all of that, but people don't have 10 years. I think people, what they're looking at the moment is, you know, what's gonna be the next 12 months? What's gonna be the next 24 months? Um, how can we fast track? How can we generate more revenue for the local music industry? I don't give a shit about the international music industry. I mean, it's honestly, I don't care. I mean, I've done that for years, but it's not, that's not interesting. That's not what we're here for. 
what we hear about is really about the local music. How do we grow the local music? How do we generate more revenue for local music? Um, that really should be the focus. I think, yes, there are, as I said at the beginning, they, there's growth. Um, I've seen the numbers. I was checking the numbers last night from Risa, which doesn't cover everything, but um, covers the main record companies, I guess. And, um, and we see there is growth. But the question today is that we're still so small in digital in the continent. I mean, you look at Latin America, you look at India, you look at, you know, I'm trying to compare markets that are comparable. We're nowhere. It's small. I mean, don't take me wrong. I'm not complaining. My business is doing extremely well. We're growing by 70% to 110% two years ago. We, we're flying. We're happy. So I'm not going to take my position and try to project. I'm just looking at the overall numbers. And the overall numbers at the moment is that if you look at a digital music business of what? Maybe $12 million in South Africa for, for local music in 2020. This is nothing. You know? I mean, we're talking about a billion dollars in, in, in Latin America between international and local. We're talking about what, 50 million? I'm sorry, I'm talking in, in dollars because that's what's comparable. And I know that the RAND just collapsed the last two days because of, the, because of a scientist who found the, the variant again. Thank you very much. But uh, <coughs> you should have just kept it in the dark for another three or four weeks, you know? It takes 120 days for the French to find variants. It takes 20 days for the South African and 28 days for the English, which is crazy. We're really good at it. Maybe, maybe we should bring them into the music business and see a way. It's stuff happening. <laughs> Finding some mutations to the music business. Um, but no, I think that's, that's really interesting. And there's a lot, I mean, we're in a much better place than we were. I mean, it depends how you look at it. But I think digitally, we're in a much better place than we were about it. If you look at the revenue streams in digital, subscription, even though it's a small number, is the one generating most of the revenue. So Spotify, for example, is a listed company so you've got all the information there. And 92 or whatever, it used to be 95% of the revenue comes from subscription. And 5 to 8% come from advertising based. So, um, and they've got like 350, I mean, I don't know how many millions now, they've got 400, 450 million subscribers. And most of them, the lion's share will be advertising based. However, subscription represent in this country, at least a year ago, 70% of the revenue. So if you look at the digital revenue, you'll see subscription driving the growth. But the problem with subscription when we look at our country is that a lot of people don't or, or don't want or, don't, or, don't, or can't subscribe to a 70 round or 80 round or whatever it is. So they go into the more advertising based, which is great. So we've had a, a huge uptake in the number of people listening digitally to music great thing because a few years ago it used to be pirated now people have moved to the spotify free to the deezer to the huawei to whatever it is but the main revenues are still on subscription and if you look at the drive it's on subscription so the idea is how do we get more people in this country i mean we're talking about we you know we represent a catalog of mass and 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 gospel music from 89 to 2010 i guess and that space hasn't grown in the way that Ama Piano is growing or in the way that other type of genre music is growing. So if you look, you know, at the moment, and, and the nice thing about it, which is interesting, is that, the ch sorry, I'm talking a lot, but you look at the charts at the moment compared to a year, year and a half ago, Spotify, when they launched, most of the, char most of the charts was international. Today, if you look at the top 50, I will say 50% of the top 50 is local. If you look at Apple, it's the same thing. And as my team said, even at Delhi, I uh, know Adele, sorry, I thought it was local music, but uh, Adele was <laughs> is at, at the top of the charts at the moment, which is you know, <laughs> another point, but um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of encouraging directions, but we, we're, not, we, we're not there yet. I mean, when, when you go into, again, to Latin America, when you look at the, the number of streams of the Maluma, of the Faruco, of, the, of the, all those artists, the Greasy and, and all that, it, it's, it's incredible. And that shift happened very, very quickly. Here, it's going to take a bit longer. Uh, and yeah, and I'm not talking about the continent. So you are, you're speaking about demand for local content and artists, <coughs> right? And then you're speaking about, I mean, we've always known there's great talent here already, right? And now you've got um, DSPs creating playlists, cover playlists dedicated to that local content. So what needs to happen from here? I think, look, the DSPs are, are doing a great job. I mean, you look at uh, what Apple is doing. I mean, they've, they've been helping 
spreading African music into the network. You look at Spotify with all those billboards, you know, we've seen Durban Gogo, -Go, we've seen Focalistic, we've seen, you know, Lady Do on, on Times Square. It's great. I mean, right. it's nice. It, it, you see YouTube and the YouTube initiatives, it's amazing. And YouTube is an, um, such an important DSP. Uh, I, again, I'm not complaining. I think we're in a good place. But what I'm saying is, we, we haven't unlocked the potential yet. And uh, the music is there, the appetite is there, everybody's going out, I love going out, I was out last night uh, with people um, and, and, and dancing because I love that and, and I think, no, no, but it's, it's great, yeah. it's, a, it's a context, we're doing a documentary on my piano, I was in New York two months ago and when you show them the context, because listening to my piano in New York, in Brooklyn, or listening to my piano here or in Pretoria or wherever it is, is different. Right. Because there's a vibe, because there's a dance, because they don't have Savannah in New York, you know? I mean, it's like, those are the, t no, <laughs> and they don't put it on their head or whatever, facts, but that's, not, but this is the vibe. <laughs> and and, and the, it's, it's great because, and, and actually, even if you look at, I was doing this, in, uh, this looking, you know, we've got, I'm a piano in Nigeria now, but it's interesting because they not, it's not exactly the same sound as here. You know, we've had the focalistic David David O last week, Champion Sound. I was in Lagos last week on the Friday, and it's all over. This single is not even in the top 50 in this country. Mm. You know, and it's interesting. Wherever there is, like number one. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, and it's still I'm a piano. Right. But so there's nuances as well going on. Anyway, so I'm, I'm going into the side. I think you should not ask me questions. Uh, well, actually, More no. More interesting we, people we, here. We can't have this discussion in this panel at this conference without speaking about the rise of Ama Piano. We, it's the most dominant music genre in South Africa. It's the fastest growing worldwide. There's an entire panel I know dedicated to it by Music in Africa. I mean, you can look at Spotify. You can look at the covers of playlists. You can look at headlines of Rolling Stone magazine and the acknowledgement coming from international artists in the U.S., UK, listening to it, getting into it, trying to, is going to happen next. Comments, what are the opportunities for, for the genre, for other South African artists? Um, digital service providers like Apple Music, Google, Spotify, etc. they've done a lot for our industry. Mm -hmm. um, five years ago, you would struggle to listen to a South African um, recorded music outside of South Africa. You go to Europe today, um, Ama Piano is, is very popular. No, it, it is the, the most popular in Africa, but go to Europe now, you'll find that it's, it's also very popular. As I indicated earlier on that last year we got more money from our international counterparts la, uh, than we ever did. We also discovered uh, uh, to our pleasant surprise that um, Iwo Kiepara, by DJ Maporisa and Moon, Moon Charles Anelli was very popular in Belgium. And you ask yourself, you uh, okay para in Belgium? How did that happen? <laughs> it's because of these DSPs. These um, um, companies that are sometimes demonized are the ones that are pushing our music abroad. And we, instead of fighting them and demonizing them, we should be working with them. And that's exactly what we are doing. We are already in discussions with Spotify and Apple Music to say, how do we make sure that we push South African music um, outside of the Republic of South Africa? It is one thing to complain about local content. Yes, we all agree that um, our radio stations need to play more of South African music. But we can't just complain and sit back. We need to take the fight to the Europeans. If Europeans are pushing their music in South Africa, why can't we, mu we push our music in, in their own territories? And that, that is already happening uh, with the help of, of Spotify, Apple Music, and, and the like. But the biggest market for each, sorry, the biggest market for local music in any country in the world is his home country. I'm not disputing that. I mean, that's not what I said. I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, you said that. I'm just saying that before, we, I, I'm looking at the low hanging fruit, and I'm not trying to pick a fight. You sound like, but anyway. <laughs> I, then you don't know me because I'm always passionate. <laughs> and, and I will respond to anything. But the, the, the thing is that I'm French, okay? I mean, I left 25 years ago, I think, or whatever, 97, 24 years ago. There's not a country who's pushing more local music than the, than, than the French country. I mean, you know, it's like it's, 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 it's supported. I think it's, what, what we're talking about it, the South African music is being played on radio in South Africa. I mean, if I look at the media monitor, most of the local music, and you've got a few, I right. see you've got a few at the moment. Thank you. In the top 20, <laughs> but it's mostly local music. So 
we're playing, I, I'm not complaining about the lack of support of local music. I'm just saying at the moment we're in transitional position where there's no physical business. The digital business is 75 or what, 80, 80 something percent international and 20 percent local. Local is growing a bit faster than international. We know that, we've seen it. But it's an interesting thing because we know that people in this country love local music, dance to local music, support local music, but they haven't, because as I said before, most of the revenue are driven by subscriptions, the people who are subscribing to, local, to, to, um, to the DSP in this country at the moment, I tend to be more skewed to listening to catalog, international catalog and international music than local music. And I think it's gonna change. I'm not trying, to, I'm not saying we need to do anything. It will change and it will happen. And in the next five or 10 years, we'll, we should see a position where 50% of the revenue will be local music. That's, that's the only thing I was saying. I think yeah, in fact, we, sorry to, to come in here. The reason why I'm focusing more on exporting our music to, to Europe is because locally we, we, we see the numbers. We deal with these numbers from broadcasters and uh, retail um, shops. You can see the growth in terms of how much are we paying local artists compared to what was paid years before, mm -hmm. where there was a time when about 55% of all royalties were going um, offshore, but now the, the trend is reversing. So you can see that locally, South Africans love their music. There's no doubt about that. That is why we are saying now is time to say, yes, that we are dominating the South African music scene with South African music, but we can't isolate ourselves and not try to take, to take the French in their, in their, in their own game. Um, you, you look at what France did with um, Kwasa Kwasa and, and, and all that. Oh, of course, so one could say it's part of French colonialism and, and all that. Um, but we are living in a, in a globalized village. You, the, the whole thing of saying you, you'll only be looking at yourself and not worry about what is going on next door, it's a waste of time because the, the next door neighbor is going to throw stuff into your yard. So you need to say, I, this is my music. It is already dominate, dominant here, and I'm exporting it. And that's exactly what we're Maybe doing. Not, not that we are neglecting the local music yeah. scene. We, we, we wouldn't have launched the fund to talk about music production and uh, live performances if we, we were not focusing on, on local. How much of the revenue from Sampra comes from international? I mean, sorry, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let me give you guys a pause there. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, I just want to. I just want to say that, um, just from a publishing perspective, um, to the, to the points that the, both the gentlemen have made, we're definitely seeing an upside to digital from a local perspective, from our writers and producers, and you know those that we represent, and it's definitely going in the right direction. It may not be as fast as we want it to be. Talking about freemium subscribers. Um, yeah, the, you know, the value from freemium is going to be less on a stream compared to on a subscription. And one of the reasons for that is, is because our economy can't afford the, the data. So we, we're not there yet, but we will get there. I think I'm glad that there's freemium <coughs> opportunities because it takes away from the piracy. But on the flip side, it's also great that our local music is traveling the world. We are a global village. We are seeing leaps and bounds of our revenue for our local composers and authors coming through from international. And that's fantastic. So it does speak to the fact that while we may not be getting a value for our local composers and authors and artists from, a, uh, from the local DSPs, from the same DSPs from an international front where they've got the biggest numbers in terms of streams and the fact that there are more subscribing, paid subscribers, um, we're definitely seeing, um, you know, the revenue go in the right direction for our local composers and authors. So I think they're both right in yeah. different, but I just wanted to say that it's going no, in the right direction. No, and that's great. You actually provided a bit of the, the context and color as well, why international is so important to be able to push and why local is, is important to but push I, as I'm not against well. that. Don't take me wrong. I've done 65% <laughs> of our turnover on African music is outside of Africa. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I mean, we've been exporting, we've organized, I mean, I, I don't want to speak about what we do. I don't care about what we do. You don't want to hear what we do. You know, I'm, I'm going to sell all the kind of great things that we're doing and, and events that we're organizing internationally and, and the, the, the amount of money we're putting internationally to support our South African and African or our clients. But this is not the case. What I was really talking about, if I read again the, the, the topic of today, the state of the South African music industry. And I'm trying to understand about 
again, it's great. We need to go overseas. Even the Swedish, oh, for, for years, were like the biggest exporter. If you look at the per, per, per capita, whatever it was, in the 90s, Ace of Base, Dr. Alban, the Cardigans, the whatever, they were they're like one after the others. They were just exporting all the time. The key thing for them was also to build a local business, <clears throat> to make sure that there's a new one coming out, a new coming. What is exciting at the moment, and what I've seen the biggest change to go back at the moment, and that's true at Mapiano, which is great, is for once we've seen South African artists all of them traveling, all of them thinking if, uh, what's the name of the brothers again? I forgot. The Major twins. League. If Major League is in the US, is in the long, because we're the first one, and they, they again spending time in the US, I can do it as well. And if you look at, at the Nigerians with the Afrobeats, when Wiz and Olamide and Flavor and, and, and Dibange and all those guys started to go and travel all the time because of diaspora, but it's not just because of diaspora, because they will take their bags, go to New York, go to Washington, go to Texas, go to London, go wherever it is, go to weird places in Turkey or whatever it was, because <clears throat> there was money to be made because there was an audience to build. And now the South Africans and True Amapiano have done the same. And it's fascinating. I mean, we had like Abidoza who spoke yesterday, was in Paris uh, three weeks ago. We've got even in-house music. I mean, of course, Black Coffee did it first and it's amazing. But now what we're seeing is like, if he's doing, I can do it. And again, to get to the Swedish elements, when we had Bjorn Borg in tennis, and it shows you how old I am, who was the world number one, what happened is you had a whole group of people, 10 years younger, 15 years younger, started to play tennis, and then they became the Mats Wielander. There were like five or six or seven tennis players became in the top 20, because they saw, if my guy in my country can do that, I can do this. Right. <coughs> and that's what's happening. It's giving, anyway. So. No, that's great. That speaks to the enabling environment that is created because of the strength of Afmiliano uh, globally, because of this generation of artists that's out there. Um, and it's exciting to think about what can happen next. We've had a lot of interesting insights and debates and conversations. Um, and I actually have to put forward the opportunity for any questions uh, from the audience. Um, I guess we'll start with in the room. I don't know if, if it's also online, but um, can we take one or two questions? If you could raise your hand and then I think somebody, does somebody pass a mic? Okay, great. Uh, good day. So the question over there and then. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Sabio. Um, I would like to uh, get more clarity on the, the live streaming aspect. How do then us as artists monetize or get paid from it. I just would like to get more clarity on that. Who'd like to take that question? I think we've had some you know, background context from you and some of the things that you've been sponsoring. Do you have a, a quick answer on that in terms of the business uh, well, I model? Thought, I thought maybe you all would have the... the <laughs> they've <laughs> spoken so much. <laughs> <laughs> now you Please spoke about it. So. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> To make money from streaming, you need plenty of hits. And when I say plenty of hits, I'm talking at least a minimum of a million hits in order for you to start seeing some return. Um, it's, it's not so easy, but at the same time, it's not impossible. It's not, pos it's not impossible. So what we normally advise people is that push the music as much as possible. Uh, through marketing. And I think what you are um, asking has to do more with marketing more than anything else. How do you market yourself on digital platforms? Because in order for you to make at least 3,500 friends, <laughs> you'll need a million hits in, in, in order for, for, for um, your song needs to have um, been listened to or viewed at least a million times in order for you to, to walk away with 3,000 3, rands. There are no easy answers to, to, to this, but what I would say is that look at what other artists around the world are doing. But as you was indicating earlier on, if you are having 16, between 16 and 60 concerts a week, that's another way of making sure that um, you get a lot of hits um, from streaming services. Because the more you put yourself out there, through live performances, whether it's physical or virtual performances, th that's how people are going to know about you and that's how they're going to listen to, 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 to your music. Thank you. Thanks for the, for the answer. 
The second question, you've got the mic. Three and four. Okay, it's on now, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Clive Hardwick. I'm from the um, independent music community and I've been around this business for about 40 years. I just want to say initially that um, the local music repertoire, according to Reese's figures, last year was 19.2% of the total South African market. This is the lowest it's ever been in my memory. It's gone from over 50% down to 19.2%. However, just to move on from that, I'd like to ask Fanani a specific question, and that is, um, you've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and you're talking about what Sampra is doing in terms of virtual concerts and stuff like that. But I would like to ask you what you are doing in terms of technology, in terms of improving Sampra performance. I'm talking specifically of DDEX, RDX, the technology standards that are now globally um, have been ro rolled out globally. There's over 6,000 licenses now for RDX. I don't know if any of them are in South Africa. And what I want to know is, it, when do you think SAMPRA will be um, adopting these international standards, which have said that apparently they will reduce your running costs by 66%, which will mean that there's a lot more money going to record labels <coughs> and artists. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, I'll deal with the last part first. Um, saying that the adoption of this technology is going to reduce the cost by 66% is not true. That's a myth. Um, but, and I, okay, let me explain what, what I'm saying, why I'm saying it's a myth. CMOs don't spend a lot of money on trying to gather uh, data. They spend money on licensing and collection. If we could reach a point like in Germany, because it's the Germans, where music users go to CMOs and say, I'm running a restaurant, please license me. In South Africa, it's the other way around. You must be chasing people um, to license them first. And once you have licensed them, then you must be chasing them again use, through lawyers and all that for them to pay you. So the majority, the, um, the vast amount of money that CMOs spend in administration has nothing to do with DDEX and all that. It has everything to do with licensing and collection. But on the issue of DDEX, we are already using DDEX. Earlier on, I indicated <coughs> that last year in nine months, we cleared almost 300 million rands. How did we do that? Because of technology. So we are already utilizing technology and we are a, a, a participating in DDEX. Why are we participating in DDEX? We are the only neighboring right CMO in Africa that is a member of SCAPRA and IFPI. Through our association with SCAPRA and IFPI, we are already participating in DDEX. That is why you find that we paid people. Sometimes they, they didn't even know how we did it. Where did we get the information? We're getting the information from DDEX because record companies are feeding all metadata, not all of it, but because the old ones is not available, but new data is being fed into DDEX by record companies and not only South African record companies, but international record companies as well. And through that, we are able to get that information and say, oh, okay, we've been looking for this particular artist. All we wanted was to say who else performed with you when you recorded this song. And this person we, uh, has been ducking and diving. Through DDEX, we have that information. We don't have to come to you. We just have to um, absorb the information, process the royalties, and pay you. So we are already using uh, that type of technology. Thank you. Thanks for the explanation. I hope it suffices. We're actually at the conclusion of this uh, session. I'm getting a time out from the Music in Africa team. Um, thank you very much for being in the session.